thankful for that living hope that we have. Our Redeemer, our Savior, it's because of Him that we'll spend eternity in heaven. Let's sing this together. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. Because of that love, led Him all the way to the cross. I will sing of my Redeemer and His wondrous love to me. The cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer with his blood he purchased me.
We don't have to live in the bondage of sin, in darkness, Father. You have set us free. You paid the debt for us, Lord, and we're so grateful. I ask that you would have your hand on this service this morning, Lord. I ask that you would just pour your spirit upon these people, upon the pastor as he speaks, Lord. I pray that we would turn our hearts toward you, Father, and that we would, as a church, Lord, go out into our community, tell others, and point others towards you with the way that we live, with our mouths, with our, our lives, Lord. More than anything, Father, I pray that we would draw closer to you this morning through this service. For it's in your name that we pray, Father. Amen. Well, good morning. Sounded like God talking, didn't it? We're glad you're here today. By the way, if you don't know this, I am not Pastor Ryan. I need you to recognize that he is on vacation, and so I am pinch hitting today. Uh, if you're here and you haven't ever been be before, you probably shouldn't make this part of your three-week challenge. <laughs> Maybe you ought to make it a four- or five-week challenge because you don't want to judge Metro by me. So anyways, we're glad you're here. By the way, don't you love that music they just played right there? How many of you got Clint Eastwood over there with the sun behind his back? He's ready to have a gunfight. Doesn't that kind of sound like that kind of... But anyways... I, I like Clint Eastwood. You got your Bibles this morning. We're going to be looking in the book of Judges. I'm going to tell you a story that Ryan didn't preach on. And I'm not blaming him. I'm just saying he didn't preach on it or else I wouldn't preach on it. How's that? I'm not trying to correct any of his sermons, but he didn't preach on this passage, so I'm going to preach on it. How's that? The Bible says in Judges chapter 1, it says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up, because I have delivered the land into his hand. Now, I'm not exactly sure why God chose Judah. Judah is a kingly tribe. Jesus is going to come from that tribe later on. But he said, I want Judah to go up first. And the Bible says, and the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I've delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me to my lot that we might fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go up with thee 
to thy lot. So Simeon went up with him. Simeon is his brother, his brother of the same mom, okay? This is, uh, Jacob had a couple of wives, and this particular brother, they're both same dad, same mom, because Jacob had two wives and two concubines that he had 12 sons from. So he asked his blood brother, full, full deal, come help me. He says he will. Now here's the story. Bible says, Judah went up to the land, or went up with the Lord, delivered them to the Canaanites, the Perizzites of their land, and they slew of them in Bezak 10,000 men. And they found Adonai Bezak in Bez Bezak, and they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And Adonai Bezak fled, and they pursued after him, and they caught him, and they cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezak said, Three score and ten kings, seventy kings, have I uh, cut their thumbs and their great toes off and gathered their meat under my table as I have done so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and there he died. Now how many would admit that's a weird story? Come on, you can admit that in church. That is a weird story. Would you agree? I often wonder why some stories are in the Bible, and this is one of those stories. You know, some stories are hard to believe. I heard about a little boy that went to Sunday school, and the Sunday school teacher was describing Lot's wife, how she looked back and she was turned into a pillar of salt. And little Jason interrupted. He said, my mommy looked back once when she was driving, and she turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> you know, some of those stories, I'll be honest with you. Uh, one little boy asked his teacher uh, about Noah, and he told the story of Noah and the ark. And the little boy asked the teacher, he said, do you think he went fishing? And he thought about it for a few moments. And finally, the little boy said, nah, no way he could have gone fishing. He only had two worms. <laughs> That'll come to you. That'll come to you. Well, some stories in the Bible are really unique, and this is one of those unique stories that we're going to talk about this morning. If you look at this passage carefully, you're going to find that this is a story from the book of Judges. You'll remember Judges are not guys in black robes that have a gavel that sit at a bench. Uh, they're more like warriors. They're more like... Uh, men that could lead other warriors into battle, or women even. And when you read the story here from Judges, there's a lot of debate who wrote the book. Well, I personally think it was written by Samuel. Samuel's the last judge and the first prophet in the Bible, and I wouldn't be surprised that Samuel wrote the book of Judges. And when you read this passage and you read opening words, God promised Israel that they would be successful. You got a passage up here in Deuteronomy. Fellas, run that up there for me, would you? It says in Deuteronomy 7, when the Lord God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and the Termites. <laughs> Seven nations, he says, greater and mightier than thou. God makes him a promise. He said, I'm going to go in before you, and I'm going to drive these nations out. I'm going to help you. And so God basically uses Joshua. They go into the middle of the nation of Canaan. They take over the center section. They go to the south. They go to the north. And finally, they've cut the place off. And they've taken care of all of these different seven nations that the Bible's talking about. But there's still some pockets of resistance. There's still some other people that uh, are hanging out, and so they've got to go in, these 12 tribes, who by this time have been given their possessions. Their land is all kind of drawn up. They know exactly where they're going to be, and their job is to go into their possession and take care of a kind of a mopping up kind of a deal. They were, they, they were taking care. Most of the big battles were fought, but now they're going in there and they're going to have some skirmishes. 
They're going to have some little battles. They're going to fight to, to drive out the people. Well, you say, and one of the big questions in the Old Testament, you know, seven nations and God basically tells them to obliterate those nations? God basically says go in there and wipe them out? Why would God do that? Well, part of that was to help Israel stay pure and stay clean before God. Uh, there was two major religions in this neck of the woods, Baal worshiping and Ashtaroth. Baal was a female goddess, a goddess of fertility, and Ashtaroth was the male counterpart. Now, I'm not even going to describe it because it's so vile and so wicked. In a mixed audience like this, no doubt you would be offended and you need to come back instead of three weeks, you probably need to come back for three months. So I'm not going to get into that. But the bottom line is they worshiped these sex gods and they were very wicked people. And God says, I don't want you marrying them. I don't want you giving your sons and daughters to them. I want you to stay away from them. In fact, wipe them out. Go in there and clean up that mess because it's been that way forever. Now, <clears throat> let me help you some. Some of you say, well, God's not very fair. Well, I could say this. Maybe you could take it up with him. <laughs> then again, you might not have that opportunity. You'll get that. That'll come to you in a few moments also. <laughs> Bottom line is this. I'll just be real honest with you. Uh, my job's not to question the God. My God's to obey him. You see, my job isn't to try to lay out the plan. That's his job. My job just to do what he says. So God says, I'm going to send you in there, and I want you to take care of these people. And that's what they begin to do. Now, the first major guy that they come against is this guy named Adonai Bezak. Now, what I'd like for you to do this morning is I'd like for you to Start with a principle that's very important. God has promised them victory. God says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to drive them out. You don't need to worry about a thing. All you got to do is go do what I told you to do, and you'll be victorious. By the way, as a Christian, do you recognize that as God's child, you're not working for victory. You're working from victory. My victory was won at the cross. I have a Savior that died, was buried, and rose again and lives forevermore. I'm not fighting for victory. Jesus Christ has already won the victory. Are you listening? That's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that I am more, I'm more than a conqueror. Come on, is that what it says? You see, I never fight for victory. I fight from victory. Jesus has already won the victory. Now, when you get to this story... Uh, this is a story of a couple of tribes that take over this guy named Adonai Bezak. Now, go to a palace in your mind. Let's pretend. Do you ever do that anymore? Some of you say, I haven't done that in years. Well, I don't do it much either, all right? Let's go to a banquet hall. This banquet hall has got beautiful tapestries all over the walls, and there's silver chandeliers, and this Adonai Bezak is a guy who the Bible says had 70 kings living under his table. Now, I got a table up here. This table wouldn't even do justice, I think, to his table. If you got 70 people under a table, you got a few folks down there. Would you agree with that? Yeah. There'd be a whole big, long table. Either he had some kind of a dungeon underneath where his table was at, or that table was just huge. And if you go to that banquet hall, you'd see that this table would be loaded with food. And there, Adonai Bezak, he sits in his chair, and he begins to take that turkey, and he rips a leg off of that turkey, and he puts it in his mouth, and he takes a big bite off of that turkey. And then he takes that leg, and he throws it under the table. And if you listen carefully, what would you hear? Hey, can you imagine? Did that scare the, the you-know-what's out of some of you? Hey, you did a great job down there. <laughs> he had 70 kings, 70 kings under his table who the Bible said didn't have any thumbs or toes, great toes. And they lived under their trying to get the crumbs, the scraps, 
from Adonai Bezak's table. Now that's the story we're going to talk about. Let's start, first of all, by talking about who was this guy named Adonai Bezak. Well, if you look at the word, the word there basically is a, is a word that um, means Adonai, Lord, with small l, small o, small r, small d. He is the Lord. Bezak was a town. It was an area. But the word Bezak means lightning. He was the Lord of lightning. And in the scriptures, to be quite honest with you, I'll prove this to you in a minute. You just have to hang in there and wait. Uh, this is a type of none other than Satan. Did you know that Satan's got many types in the Bible? For example, the earliest type of Satan in the Bible is the serpent. Yes or no? Yeah. yeah. Adam and Eve live in this unbelievable place. And the devil takes the form of a serpent and he talks. And by the way, when you read that story, it doesn't seem like either one of them freaked out from a talking snake. I would. There ain't no doubt about that. If a rattlesnake goes, hey, Phil, how's it going? What's happening with you today? How's it going? I guarantee you, I'd be gone. There's no doubt about it. But this, this, the Bible says that Satan is a snake. He's a serpent. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, the Bible calls him a red dragon. You know, the Bible is filled with terms that talk about Satan. Now, let me help you with some. As Christians, most of the time, we have two major kind of responses when we talk about Satan. Some of us can find Satan in everything that happens. I've, I've met some people that blame Satan for everything. Satan is in the washing machine. It won't work. <laughs> or Satan's in my car. It wouldn't start. Or Satan's in my husband. He's a, you know what? He's a devil. I think some people see Satan in every bush. And I'll be real honest with you. When you study the scriptures, and I, I really, this is not, really isn't what I'm trying to preach, I, I really don't think that that's correct. I don't think every time you have an argument, there was a demon of argument in there. I think most of the time is you got up on the wrong side of the bed and you acted like a turkey. Yes or no? Yeah. We, you remember the first people that sinned in the Bible? It was Adam and Eve. How many remember the story? When God comes down, by the way, that's where blame shifting started. God asks Adam, he says, why did you do that? Who told you you were naked? Why did you eat of the tree? And he said, it was that woman you gave me, Lord. Yes or no? That's exactly what he said. Now, notice when he talks to Eve, he said, why have you done this? He doesn't blame a demon. A demon of lust. A demon of adultery. All this, man, these radio preachers are crazy. He says, why have you, you're the problem here, not a demon. That means you need to amen or say something. Otherwise, I have mud flaps by the time I go home. Now, the bottom line is, I don't believe there's a demon of all that kind of... Uh, sometimes you'll read in the scriptures that demons are unclean. You'll see that there's a demon that maybe is a, dumb, a spirit of, of, of not being able to speak. That's not saying that there's a demon out there that makes you dumb. No, it's just saying that was the characteristic of that particular demon, all right? I don't believe that demons are the reason why I get messed up in my life. The reason I get messed up in my life is because it's Phil's fault. Look in the mirror. I'll show you what 100% of your problem is. Are you listening to me? Don't blame it on somebody else. Blame it on the person that's responsible. And that's usums. Amen, Pastor. That's good preaching. Well, Satan is a type here. So what have we learned about Satan? He's real. What have we learned about Satan? He's our enemy. What have we learned about Satan? He is dangerous. But let me help you. We've learned also he's defeated. He's defeated. Jesus defeated him at the cross. Now, I almost hate to make a joke here, but... 
a good joke every once in a while helps my sermon, so I'm going to tell you one. I don't think that Satan is a joke, but I'm going to make a joke, okay? When you, I heard about a church where one day the preacher got up to preach, and right in the middle of the service, Satan appeared. I mean, standing right there, he, he appeared, and man, these Baptist folks looked at that preacher, and the preacher took off through the side door, and people started leaving the building, and there was one old man standing there, and he was sitting right there, and, and Satan walks up to him, he said, how come you're not running like the rest of them? He said, because I ain't afraid of you. He said, what do you mean you're not afraid of me? He said, don't you realize I could take you to hell for the rest of your eternity and you'll spend time in torment and agony? Yeah, I know that. Don't you recognize that I can mess your life up beyond unbelievable repair? He said, yeah, I know. Then why aren't you afraid of me? He said, because I've been married to your sister for 47 years. (laughs) Now, Satan's real. There's no doubt about it. Are we to be afraid of him? Well, there is a verse that says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in where? The world. Now, let's, let's, let's talk about what I really want to talk about. Because I really didn't come to talk about Satan, even though I do believe that Adonai Bezak is none other than Satan. Fellas, can you put Luke up there for a moment? Luke chapter, it's not chapter 1. Let me, let, me, let me look it up real quick. How, how about if you take your Bibles and turn over to the Gospel of Luke just for a second. Let's see if I can find it. I, gotta, I think it's chapter 11. Let's look at Luke chapter 11. This is a passage. Uh, I got to prove my point to you just because I want to make sure I can do it. The Bible says, let me see if I can find my passage. I'm looking for my passages. I've lost my I've lost my passage. Can you believe it? Luke chapter 10. That'll work better. Luke chapter 10, verses 17. The 70 return. How many of you remember Jesus had disciples and he sends these guys, these guys out? And the Bible says there were 70 of them that went out. And they came back. And let's see what the report is from their preaching assignment. Look what it says. It says, they came back and they, uh, they said, man, the Lord, listen. He said, the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he said, I beheld Jesus as Satan, as lightning falling from where? Heaven. I told you this Adonai Bezak is a type of Satan. This is talking about Satan falling from heaven. And Jesus said it looked like lightning. Adonai Bezak is the Lord of lightning. That's the type here. He's a type of none other than Satan. How many got my point now? And so they begin bragging, they're lying, and they're saying, man, man, we did all these wonderful things. And Jesus stops them up short, and he says, fellas, if you're going to rejoice, read the last verse. He says, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. More important than being able to cast out demons is the fact that someday you spend eternity with me, your names written in heaven. How many got that? So what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about, I think he's talking about when Satan was kicked out of heaven back in Isaiah chapter 12, Ezekiel chapter 28. And when Jesus watched that, he said it looked like lightning falling from heaven. So Adonai Bezak is a type of Christ or a type of Satan. Now, let me move on because that's really not my sermon. (laughs) Let me get to where I want us to be. Let's talk about who those 70 kings represent. All right, stay with me. You got your Bible? Turn back to Judges again. Judges chapter 1. You ready? All right. This is the part where you need to pay attention. All that other stuff was getting you to this point. This is what Satan would love to do in your life. What Adonai Bezak did to the 70 kings is exactly what Satan would like to do to us. Now, how many of you believe this? And by the way, you should believe this. How many of you believe that Satan can't get your soul? If you're saved, is is Satan able to get your soul? No. But let me ask you a question. Do you think it's possible that Satan wants to get your life? Yeah. Yeah. Notice some characteristics of these kings. Number one, they were dethroned. I don't have time, but let me just say this. 
in the days of the Bible, in the days of Judges, this is talking about basically a city-state. There was a king of Ai. There was a king of Jericho. Remember all these places? And so there were these 70 kings. They all had their own little kingdom, but it was more like, a, like the king of Davison County or the king of Murfreesboro or the king of whatever you want to say. Bottom line is they had all of these different things, and he had come in, and he had un, uh, dethroned them. He took away their thrones, and in order to humiliate them, he cut their thumbs and their toes off and put them under his table. So the first thing that Satan is going to do in your life, listen to me, there's always going to be a battle for the throne of your heart. Satan fights you for that. That's why 1 Peter chapter 3, and it's up there if you want to look at it, they'll show it to you. 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Let me give you the Phil Martin Amplified. Make sure that Jesus sits on the throne. Make sure that God is ruling your life. Don't let it be you. Don't let it be something else. There's always a struggle. There's always a battle for who is going to sit on your heart's throne. You know, I've been saved a long time, and I'll be honest with you, it's not any easier being saved now than it was when I was a kid. In fact, I think it gets harder. You know, I found out in my own life, there's been some times when possessions reared its ugly head I'm just going to be real honest right now. We, I'd like to get a new car. And I've been praying about it. I've been praying about it. And I've been helping the Lord pray about it. <laughs> I've been pointing out some good deals I found. <laughs> but right now, the Lord hadn't given me the big green light. How many talk, know what I'm talking about? And I'm praying about what the Lord wants me to do. And right now, I'll be real honest with you. That, 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 19, that 2012 car that my wife's got, has got about 85,000 miles on it, and I've already rationalized, she needs a newer car. It's dangerous to let your wife drive around in a hunk of junk. It's called rationalization. <laughs> and you know, I've found out in my life, hey, by the way, something that can rule my life and sit on the throne of my heart is possessions. I remember when I was 18 years old, I had another battle. It was called a person. I met this little girl. We were seniors in high school. Her name was Donda, and it was my first true love. Come on. Don't stare at me like I'm a freak. Do you remember back that far in your life? Man, I mean to tell you, I was smitten. I remember coming home at night, my mom said, where you been? I've been over at Don's house. She's bad for you, son. You ought not to hang around with her. I came home one night about midnight. Mom was on her knees. I could hear her praying for me. Dear God, please don't let that boy get mixed up with that girl. I... I kind of had second thoughts then. Mama hates her that bad. <laughs> Life's going to be tough if I ever got married. How many understand that principle? Yeah. You with me? How many have ever had a person sit on the throne of your heart? I see sometimes people get obsessed. I've seen some that made their throne of their heart power. Power. Possessions. People. I remember when I went off to Bible college, there became a personality. I was following after a particular person, and he became my guru, and he was the one that I quoted. He's the one that hung the moon. When I got out to preach, I wanted to be just like him. The only trouble is, Lord wanted me to be just like me. Lord wanted me to follow after him and let him be. That's why Peter says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. How many of you notice there's a struggle about who's going to sit on the throne of your heart? He dethroned them. 
The second thing he did to them, he, I know this isn't good English, he defumed them. The Bible says he cut off their, 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 their great thumbs, their big, their big toes and their thumbs. Why would he cut off their thumbs? Let me illustrate. Let me ask you a question. This is my grandson's. I don't play with swords anymore at my house. But anyways, this is my grandson. In order to grip a sword, you have to have a thumb. What they did was they cut the thumb off. They cut the hawk. They cut the meat part of that. They just cut it all the way off. And basically what he ensured was the fact that he'd never be able to fight again. His gripping of a sword would be like that. And any other sword would knock it right out of his hand. Are you listening? Let's say, let's say it's a bow and arrow. When you pull back that bow with that arrow, you got to have a thumb or that. Oh, it didn't hurt. It's plastic. <laughs> this is wood. This is plastic. <laughs> that thing hits you right in the face. You got to have a thumb in order to do battle. Are you listening? By the way, one of the things I've seen, what Satan loves to do to Christians, is he loves to take away their testimony so they can't wield the sword anymore. So they can't pull the bow back. Hey, I've seen some Christians, honestly, they started eating the crumbs at the devil's table and it wasn't long until they lost their reputation. Their words were hollow. Their words didn't mean much because their life was in ruins. They'd lost their thumbs. Satan comes along and he wants to dethrone. He wants to dethumb. But notice this, he wants to defeat. By the way, it's not D-E-F-E-8, it's D-E-F-E-E-T. He defeated them. He cut their toes off. He cut their big toes off. Now what's the purpose of cutting your big toes off? Well, when you walk, what do you push off of? That big toe. That, that big toe. When you have balance, where does your balance come from? You got to have that toe in there or else you're, you're always wobbling. Satan will come along and he'll dethumb us, he'll defeat us. You know, I've met a few wobbly Christians. Paul talks about running the race, and he said, he said to the Galatians, he said, who's cut in on your stride? The Christian life is compared to a race, and we're running the race, and Paul says, I can't believe you were running great. Who cut in on your stride? Who came along and tripped you up? What happened to your stride? Football players, there's a, guys, this is the quarterback from Kansas City. What's his name, Matt Patrick? Mahomes, is that his name, something like that? What I'm talking about, he, he got turf toe. You say, Pastor, what's turf toe? Well, if you look, he's, he's on astroturf. One of the problems with astroturf, you spring that big toe joint, and it takes weeks, sometimes months, for an athlete to get out there and run again because you've messed his feet up. I don't know about you, but there's been a few times my dogs were killing me. How many of you ever had a bunion? How about a callus? How about a blister? How about plantar fasciitis? We could keep going with that. Rose is down here speaking in tongues because she knows what a bone spur is. I told her the other day, She's asked me, she knew I had one. She said, how'd you get rid of your bones for? I said, I jumped off the back of a pickup. She went home and jumped off her table. Now I'm a faith healer. She said, Pastor, it worked. <laughs> oh, my name's Dr. Phil. You might as well come talk to me. I can give you advice. 
Satan comes along and he dethrones us. He disables us. He defeats us. Listen to me. Finally, he degrades us. Can you imagine 70 once proud kings now begging for scraps for a turkey leg? Now they're fighting one another with no thumbs and no toes, and they're throwing blows in the dark under the table, scrapping for just a little bit of morsel of food? Oh, let me tell you something. Satan likes to make sport of a Christian. Are you listening? Read the story of Samson. Brian's going to get there. Samson is bound. Samson is blinded. Samson is grinding. And then they say, bring Samson out that we might make sport of him. There's some of you, you can't witness for Jesus anymore. You can't say much about Jesus anymore because bottom line is you don't have any thumbs. You don't have any great toes. You've been dethroned. Now, to be quite honest with you, you're being degraded. You see, that's what Satan wants to do in our lives. Boy, I wish I could get this across. Satan loves to make sport of a Christian. I got to quit. I don't want you to say that preacher preached for an hour and a half. I don't want to do that. Look at 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter just for a moment. 1 Peter chapter 5. Now I want you to turn there. Fellas, can you put that up there for me? What's some decisions that we can make? What does the Bible say? We're in 1 Peter chapter 5, about verse 7, somewhere in there. Look what it says. It says, be sober. Now it's not talking about don't drink. It's saying be alert. It says be alert, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now quickly, let me just tell you three decisions that we can make as God's children. Number one, be alert. I don't want you to see Satan in every bush and a demon in every crowd. But I do want you to recognize there is a real Satan out there. Scripture says, be alert. He's a, he's a dangerous enemy. He's a formidable, formidable enemy. And we as God's children have to be vigilant. We have to be, don't write him off. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be alert. Here's the second one. Respect him. Respect him. Not fear him. Not revere him. Respect him. There's a passage in Jude, and I'll not take the time to turn, but the Bible talks about, and this, and this story isn't even in the Bible. I can't find it anywhere. The Bible says that when Moses died, that Micah the archangel and Satan had it out over the body of Moses. Now, the Bible never tells you that story. It never gives you any information, but the Bible says in Jude that they had a big battle over Moses' body. The Bible says that God killed Moses and God buried Moses and evidently Satan looked it up, found out where he was and God dispatched his angel, Michael the archangel, and he went and he came against Satan. And the Bible says that he didn't make a railing accusation. But he basically, in the name of God, the name of Christ, he won the battle by by, by putting Satan in his place with God's word. I'm not afraid of Satan this morning, I'll be right honest with you, but I have a healthy respect for him. Brother Alan Hardy, how long have you been an electrician? 50 years. I knew it was a long time. 50 years. You know why he's been an electrician for 50 years? I'm not the smartest guy in the whole world. He has a healthy respect for electricity. 
I was <laughs> messing with my house the other day. And I had my screwdriver out and I was doing something. <laughs> I couldn't turn loose with that screwdriver. I said, boy, that was stupid. I ain't going to try that again. You know, if you're going to be an electrician, you better have some respect for that electricity. As a Christian, listen to me. I don't think we should fear Satan, but I think we ought to respect him. Quickly, let me say the third thing. We need to resist him. Listen to what the Bible is, what the Bible says. It says, if you look at this passage, it says, and go ahead, fellas, put me back up there. It says, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. There we go. It says, whom resist steadfast. What the word steadfast means? Just be firm. Bible doesn't ever tell you to fight them. Bible just says stand. My job as a Christian isn't to let the battle go on between me and Satan. My job as a Christian is to just to take a stand and say, no, we're not going to do it that way. That ain't going to happen. I'm going to resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that there has been other people that have won doing the very same thing. Resist him. Jesus resisted Satan in Matthew chapter 4. Boy, I just don't have time to preach all this. But how did Jesus resist him? He didn't call him, you dirty yellow belly. He didn't go at, you spirit of fear, like these southern preachers do on the radio. Jesus just quoted him the scriptures, as it is written. And he quoted him the Bible, quoted him the Bible. You say, how do you resist him? Steadfast in the faith. You stand in the faith. You just quote him the word of God. Satan can't take the Bible. Are you listening? This week... I'm doing good on my time. How many noticed that? <laughs> David, I appreciate you letting me get up here early. You cut out some of your singing this morning. I know you did because I looked at the time. This week we had an exciting thing happen. I got up. What day was it, Cindy, when we had the burglar, the guy stealing the mail? Was it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? Yeah. I got out of bed. I would do my walking. Every, she's my neighbor, by the way. I do my walking early. I do it at daybreak. I know some of you don't know anything about daybreak, but that's when the sun comes up. <laughs> and you say, Pastor, why do you go walking at daybreak? Because I walk in shorts and a t-shirt, and I don't want my neighbors to see me. I'm afraid it'll scare their dogs and their small children, so I, I do it under the cover of darkness. So when the sun's barely up, when it's cool, fat people sweat. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> so I go when it's early, the coolest time I can walk. And I, was, I got up, and my wife, she wasn't seeing the sun come up. But anyways, uh, she was laying in the bed, and I, I noticed a pickup truck. By the way, uh, Mick and some of the deacons, Brother Mike, some of them put some Big, beautiful bushes in the back of my house. They've grown up into trees. Man, they're huge. And that's my backyard. I don't really have a fence, but I have these big, huge pine trees now, and those things are probably 25 feet tall now. And, when, and by the way, you did that for me when I was your pastor, and you did for my birthday, I think, if I remember correctly, about six or eight years ago. And by the way, can I just say how much I love you and how much I appreciate all the stuff you did for me? You sure did far more for me than I could ever do for you, and I appreciate what you've done for me. I don't, I don't want you to give me a hand. I, I mean that seriously. But I looked out there, and I saw between those trees a beige pickup truck. And I thought, Fisher Grove Road, that's a weird place to park your truck. I wonder why somebody's parked their truck right there. I didn't think much about it. I... I went for my walk. The sun was coming up. It was time to go. I had to get out there. 
So I got out there and did my thing, and I came back in the park, and the truck was still there. By this time, my wife's up, and I took her out there to the windows, and I said, look, there's a weird truck parked out there. Somebody's parked a truck on Fisher Grove Road. Well, I was a good neighbor. I didn't call the police, which I should have done, but I was watching it. One of my neighbors called the police. Pretty soon the sheriff showed up, Robertson County Sheriff. And they got over there to that pickup truck and there was two young guys from Nashville sleeping in that truck. And they started looking around and these suckers were stealing mail from people's mailboxes. And they found mail all spread out in the lawn and all over their car. And both of them suckers are still in jail. Cindy, you got some of your mail stolen. Yeah. It brought back to me, be sober. Be vigilant. You could have some crooks sitting 150 yards, 150 feet from your house in a pickup truck on a Tuesday morning, about 6 o'clock in the morning. You don't know what's happening. By the way, Satan wants you to be fat, dumb, and stupid. And most Christians I know are fat, dumb, and stupid. <laughs> because we've been eating too many crumbs too many crumbs from the devil's table. No pun intended. Maybe that's why we're crummy Christians. <laughs> Amen, Pastor. We're glad we came today. He'll dethrone you. He'll defeat you. He'll disable you. And then he'll shame you. He'll shame you. Never happened to me. The Bible says, Him that thinks he stands, take heed, lest he fall. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I haven't preached one of those messages that makes you feel good, but I have preached one of those messages that we need to hear. I pray this morning, Heavenly Father, we wouldn't be crummy Christians. Lord, help us not to live for the snacks that we can get from the devil's table. Help us this morning to be alert and to respect Satan and to resist him in our lives. Help us not to blame our sin on him. Lord, help us to recognize that you say, hey, look in the mirror. It's called temptation. You gave in to it. You're responsible. You're the one that blew it. Don't blame it on somebody else. You're the one that did it. God, help us to recognize that Satan prowls. He doesn't, he doesn't send a text message. He doesn't warn us ahead of time. He, he just kind of shows up in a, in a beige pickup truck. Seems a little bit out of place. Help us to be watching. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. How many Christians this morning would say, Pastor, truth be known, I'm fighting a battle in my heart right now on who's going to be the throne, who's going to be on the throne. Not you, not Satan. The Bible says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. How many say, Pastor, I'm struggling with that right now in my life. I, i got to make sure that Jesus is on the throne of my heart. How many Christians this morning say, Pastor, and by the way, it's going to take courage to raise your hand now. How many Christians, be honest, and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm struggling about who's going to be on the throne of my heart. Raise your hand. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you this morning. You can put it down. How many be honest enough to say, Pastor, I've been disabled. I've got something in my past. I've got something in my life that I've tried to cover up and I don't want anybody to know about it but I, I can't draw the bow like I used to I can't wield the sword of the spirit the way I used to because I, I'm disabled might there be a Christian this morning say pastor I need to get back in the race 
I'm not going to let that turf toe keep me down anymore. I'm going to run, like Paul said. I'm not going to let anything cut in and hinder my stride. I'm going to run the race that God set before me. How many this morning said, Pastor, that's true in my life. I want that to be the way it is in my heart. How many say, Pastor, pray for me today. Would you lift your hands today? Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you today? Heavenly Father, speak to us. Speak to us today. Help us to make the decision that you want us to make. In Jesus' name, amen. Look up here just for a second. I don't want you to leave without hearing this part. Jesus Christ loves you today. Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ gave his all so that you could be saved. You say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. Can I tell you something? Christ won that victory when he died, was buried, and rose victorious from the grave. I serve a risen Savior today. Do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? If you don't, you can. Pastors are going to stand here at the front. They're going to come forward in just a second. Hey, listen, if you need to be saved, don't leave this place without Jesus. But Christians, listen to me. Don't leave this place spiritually the way you came. Don't let this right over your heads. I've talked to you about a real problem. His name's Satan. He's out there. You better revere him, respect him. You listening? He doesn't always drive a beige pickup truck, but he's out there, I promise you. Let's stand. Let's stand. We're going to sing just for a second. You say, Pastor, I'd like to be a member of a church like this. It's easy. Come I forward. Talk to one of these preachers. I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. Come to Jesus today. I worship Come to Christ today. you, oh Prince oh, of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. Thanks for coming today. I know Pastor Ryan's out of town. I do appreciate getting to preach to you. And by the way, I, I still love you. I, I, I'm not being ugly. Will you listen to me for a second? I miss Sundays horribly. But I rejoice Monday through Saturday. <laughs> I am so glad I'm not the pastor anymore. I, I really, the pressure's gone. I don't have the stress in my life like I did. You say, why did you have stress? <laughs> well, I could explain it to you, but it might take a while. How's that? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I sure miss preaching to you. you and, I, and I love you too. And I'm grateful for the day that I could come and preach. And whenever Ryan needs me, I'll say yes. All right? Who's going to come up and do what you're going to do now? Stephen, you come. All right. If you're wanting to know what causes the stress, it's those, uh, that hairy-legged son-in-law that used to be your children's pastor. <laughs> That's me right here. Um, I've got a couple quick announcements. First off, if you're a guest, thanks so much for coming to be with us. Um, if I haven't met you, if you haven't filled out a connection card, I'd love to meet you right here at guest services. Also, for those of you guys that have been uh, coming back, if you've noticed, there are a lot of new families. Along with that means there's a lot of new kids. And uh, we're actually going to have to open a new nursery here in about three weeks. And we could use some help. If you're willing to serve, even if it's just a once a month type of thing, either during the Sunday school hour, during the church hour, come and see my wife right here at the Next Steps counter as soon as we dismiss. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you for this incredible challenge that Pastor Phil brought. Lord, I pray that as we live our lives that we would be aware of what the devil's trying to do to us, that we would be alert to what he's doing. And Lord, I pray that we'd keep our eyes on you and that we'd keep focused. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.